My name is Lisette Engel and I will be talking, I don't want to say presenting, but I'm going to be talking and holding a conversation about mothers raising sons and the joys, the woes, the challenges and all the fun that comes along with it. So I'm really excited to be here. This is the second year that um, I get to participate. It's also the second year of the conference. So um, I hope you're getting something out of it. Um, I wanted to introduce myself and how I fit into this whole um, world of single parenting. Um, I am 32 years old and I think that's important to point out because I was a teen mom and um, it, so along with being a single parent, being a single parent of a boy, um, there were some additional challenges. So I'm excited to hold a conversation about that. And if you have any questions or have any comments throughout, just feel free to jump into the conversation. So I want to start off by introducing you to a little bit of my life. Um, this is my son. That was a few years ago. This is what it looks like now. He's 14 years old. And I'm also a mom to a daughter. She's 16. Um, that picture was taken when I finished my master's um, a year and a half ago. So we've been through quite the journey. So the things that I want to talk about today um, are all these challenges that come along with um, being the parent of a child of an opposite sex. Um, who here can relate to potty training and going to the bathroom? When you're at Target and they don't want to go with you into the mother, into the women's bathroom and you're like, but I can't take you into the other bathroom. Um, and so how challenging is that? And, you, and something so small that just makes you feel like, oh my gosh, like I can't even take my kid to the bathroom and he just thinks I'm the worst mom ever. Um, so when he was little, I mean, there were tantrums galore because he wanted to go into the big boy's bathroom. And it's a little scary because, you know, you hear so many things that happen and you're just so distrustful. Um, so it was just like a whole bunch of bribery that had to happen for us to go into the bathroom just like an in and out. Um, sometimes I'd go as far as asking someone coming out of the bathroom, be like, is there anybody in there? Can he just go in and out real quick? I mean, we had to do all that. Um, when we'd go out with my younger brother, my younger brother was one of the most, um, the, the most supportive role model for my son. Um, he was there to help me and, you know, he'd put him right in his place a lot when he wasn't listening to me, but he always liked going places when my brother was around because he was the only one that could take him to the one bathroom that didn't, um, you know, that had urinals, which at first he didn't know how to use, by the way, so he ended up using it as a toilet once, and that was a wake-up call for me to say, you know what, I need to ask for help because <laughs> we are not using the urinal like we're supposed to. <laughs> um, Father's Day, I mean, Father's Day was brutal. It's like in school, they're writing cards and making messages and trying to talk about it you know memories with your dad and I myself come from a single parent household so I knew how hard it was for me when June rolled around and I didn't have anybody to kind of you know write a card to or get a present to so having those conversations as my son has gotten older is really hard and the way that we navigated that was just like, okay, well, Father's Day can be for anybody. We need to pick a special dad out there who's in your life and write a card for them or do something. And um, I blog. So one of the blog posts that I wrote recently was on how Father's Day is really also a holiday for single moms because we do it. And the, there's been a lot of disagreement on, okay, well, you know what? Yeah, you're the mom, but you shouldn't take that away from people. But I honestly believe that you're doing it all. We're doing it all. And there's no reason why I can't take that away if I'm also the dad in the home. Any thoughts on that? Um, my son was actually born with a medical condition. So here we are, young parent, single parent, and then also the parent of a child with special needs. And just having to juggle the schedule of being the only person who can take him to doctor's visits, the only person who can go to school meetings, the only person who can attend therapies, the only person who has to keep all this information in my head has been incredibly challenging. And I can't tell you how many times I've felt so bad because I've gotten a reminder call and I'm like, 
oh, I have an appointment tomorrow that I had no idea and I just did not budget time for. Um, transportation was a really big issue for me at first. Um, uh, I was a student here at Montgomery College and I didn't have a car, I lived in Montgomery Village. So just to get to class on time, I had to leave my house almost an, two hours before I was supposed to be here, which made childcare challenging, which made me feel constantly guilty that I wasn't giving my kid enough time. And then when they go into school and they're placed you know, in an IEP special ed setting, they not only further trumps your um, self-esteem thinking that it, because I'm doing all these things and because I'm doing it alone, I'm responsible for this situation. Um, so the journey of beating myself up for being a single parenting has been something that I've battled with for years and years. Custody battles and disappointing visits. So early on, I learned that the best thing I could do for my kids was put in place a custody order. Like I needed to know that I was going to be in control. And there's so many misconceptions about if you file for child support, well then dad needs to see him. But sometimes those relationships aren't the healthiest. So I was really scared. Well, I know I need the money and I need the help, but I don't really think that this guy being around my child is the most, um, will be the most beneficial of relationships for him. So I had to do a lot of digging of information, asking a lot of questions and making sure that I knew what my rights were and what the benefits of having a custody order in place was. And especially when you have a child who has a medical condition, when you go to the hospital and there's different things that you need to sign, it is so important to have something in writing that says, you know what, you're the, um, you have sole custody, you have sole physical and legal custody. And those two things mean different things. And we can talk about that if you have questions. Um, and with child support as well. Because, you know, we have a visitation order that Mr. X has never abided to, even though it's right there. And it's heartbreaking and infuriating when you're the one who's standing right there with your child and they don't get picked up. And on the one hand, you're so angry and you want to like say, you know, the truth and, and want to be able to relate how you feel and your disappointment. But you also have to be mindful of the kind of relationship that you're building with your child and whether or not they should be angry at the other person or they're going to be angry at you because nobody wants resentment as they get older. And finally, girls. Like how, um, my son is 14 now, so hormones are raging. Um, anybody have teenage sons in here? Yes. So what grade? 13. 13. 13. Yeah. So you're seeing some of, yeah. How about you? Two years old? I was just asking if there were any mothers with teenage sons in here. No? Okay, well, that'll be fun. We can talk about that. <laughs> it's the dating and, you know, how you look at girls and how you respond to those questions and talking about the elephant in the room, which is sex. And, and I mean, it's hard enough talking to my daughter about it. But you have to be open and you have to feel comfortable because if you're making faces and you're scared about it, they're not going to trust you. And trust is such a big piece of navigating this whole single parenting thing. So what is it that I did to stay sane and to make it and <laughs> to get through it and have my son still be alive at 14? Um, <laughs> You know, I, I learned early on that I couldn't be scared of asking for help. Like, I couldn't do it alone. I needed a village. And it's really hard when you're a single parent because people judge you. I mean, honestly, people will judge you when you feel judged. And even when you have people that are really just there for you and are 100% invested in your success, you still feel a little uneasy because we, we live in these bubbles and we just don't think that there's other people like us around us. And I think that... or. Um, Events like today are just really important because we can all see and connect and, and meet other people that are in our same shoes. You know, like I was able to benefit from meeting other young mothers who were also in the same situation as me, living with their parents, trying to work in school, no help from dad. So being able to open up and have those honest conversations that make us feel vulnerable were really important, which led me to therapy. I had to understand that I needed professional help. One, to navigate my son's diagnosis, and two, to really dig deep into what my own experiences and how they were contributing to what my parenting was looking like. 
So I was living in a multi-generational home with my mom and my brother, and you know, we're Hispanic, and so culturally that takes on a whole different take on parenting. Um, but I'm American, so my idea of parenting is different than my mother's or my entire family's. And so it's really having to put all those things in perspective so that my kids are not messed up. And so that when they grow up, they don't need therapy themselves. And that was my main goal, is really how can I identify the needs of my children so that they're growing up to be successful, healthy adults who can communicate, who can open up, and I'm being able to be a part of their lives in a way that's beneficial to their growth. Um, so we try different ways of therapy. Um, we've done individual and we've done family therapy, and that has been very helpful for me. Um, I was also part of various programs. We started out with, I've been through everything, I feel like, um, family services and their early childhood programs, Head Start, Case management can be a little bit scary, but it was a lifesaver for me because I took a lot of parenting classes to really understand how to be a better parent. And you know, there, there's this idea of what we see on TV or what we read about, and we want to make sure that we're there, uh, but that doesn't always happen. So you have to find what works for you individually. And you know what? If it doesn't look like what you're reading or what you're seeing, that's okay. You do what works for you. Lots of communication. You have to create a space where your children feel safe talking to you about different things. And sometimes they're gonna tell you more than you need to know or that you want to know or wish you knew, but just that alone is, is a success. So um, my son is going into high school and um, I picked him up from summer school. He's in a um, summer program. And, the first thing he does on um, one of the weeks I picked him up, he's like, Mom, there's this girl who likes me. And I said, oh, great. Tell me about this girl. And, well, she says she loves me. And I'm like, whoa, like, what's her name? How old is she? How, when did you meet her? They have met three days. This little girl apparently was just like, so in love with him. She was chasing him through the classes. And it got to be a little scary because now she gave him his, her phone number. She was inviting him to the house. And it's like... You know, and, but the fact that we had established that open communication channels meant that I could put a stop to it because if we didn't have that, I don't know, he could have gone over to her house and we would have never known. Um, so I'm glad that summer school's over, that we're never gonna see her again. <laughs> um, but it just, it kind of made me freeze because this is getting real now to the point where we're going to have to have those honest conversations about what relationships look like, what the right amount of time should be, what I want for him is not necessarily what's realistic for his own timeline, and I have to understand that. Um, one of the things that I really want to talk about and that I hope that we can have a conversation on is love languages. And that's uh, a book that was given to me by a friend when I was in the parenting classes way back when. Um, I never really took it seriously until I actually like sat down to read it and it was a great way for me to learn how is it that my children respond best and um, the author of the book talks about five different ways that we can show and express love and it's really interesting because it's not just for children but there's different volumes for there's one for single parenthood um, there's one for dating, there's one for married couples, and then there's the one for children. And that one was especially helpful for me because it was kind of like my little Bible to see how is it that I can connect to my children so that I'm doing all these other things and so that I'm successful. Yes, five love languages of children. Um, so the five love languages are listed up here, and that's words of affirmation. And what that means is like praise. So if you notice that your child responds well to them getting a compliment, or you know if they did if they got a good grade in in school, and they come home and you're just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You have a conversation about that. That's their motivation, and that's how they know that you love them. That's how they receive love. Now there's, there's other children who, who appreciate gifts and that's how they know. If you buy them something, it's like, oh my gosh, my mom loves me. 
you know, so, and that's true for a lot of other people. They need to feel, they need to get gifts, and that's in the form of, you know, whether it's something expensive or not. But that's a very interesting and expensive love language, and I'm glad that my kid doesn't respond to that one. <laughs> Acts of service. Um, as I was reading this book, I realized that my love language is acts of service. I need to see people doing something for me or that they care about me or that they value me by either listening to a request that I made or cleaning up after themselves. Um, the same thing for, for children is if you take them to the park or if you help them with their homework or if you do something that means something to them, whether it's really tiny or really big, that makes a huge difference. And that one is usually tied into quality time. That's my son's love language. He needs to feel that he's spending time with me. I mean, he even asked me if he could come to, to the conference today because he just enjoys that time that we spend. I was talking earlier about how I often felt guilty for not being there. Um, when I was going to school and working, I went to school full time. So meaning that I had to be out you know, four days a week and I worked full time. So I was spending like maybe three hours a day with my kids and I felt absolutely awful because I thought that I wasn't giving them the attention and that you know, I wasn't there enough for them and it was just this constant guilt trip. So when I did have time, I forgot to take care of myself and I was dedicating all this time to my kids and that was really harmful for me because I wasn't fueling my own personality and what I, what was making me a good person and if I wasn't happy then really I wasn't being good to anybody and that's something that I had to learn along the way um, but quality time it's not about the amount of time that you spend with your kids although that's great but it's how you choose to spend that time and for a long time I didn't have very much money so I the Montgomery County Recreational Guide was my, my best friend because doing all the free festivals doing all the things that didn't require any admission or didn't require me to pre-register because sometimes things happen. For this workshop, we had 43 people registered. And you can see around the room that there's not even half of that because things happen. People just can't get to places. People are not able to make it. Plans change, and especially when you're the one person who is doing it all, you can't allow yourself to feel guilty about it. And finally, physical touch. You know, it's that hugging, it's that taking of the hand, it's just sitting right next to each other and cuddling. Um, that, I don't, I'm not very familiar with that because I personally like my space and thankfully my kids do too. But it's really good to have all these things in perspective so that you can understand, oh my gosh, there's so many different ways that we can show love and that we can connect with our kids. And even for boys, and I know this might not be relatable, but it really is. It, creates that pathway or that opportunity to start building that relationship. So I'm talking a lot, but I really want to hear about what your challenges are so that we can have a conversation and kind of discuss and come up with ideas and resources of what we can do together. Because again, you're here to get something out of this workshop and I want to make sure that we're addressing that. Oh, if you can help me chase my baby out of the bed. He's seven. <laughs> He's seven. He doesn't want to sleep in this room. Every night he oh, cries. Wow. He has to sleep in my bed. So has he always been co-sleeping with you? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> I try so much, but he cries so loudly that it, I end up just going, I'm like, okay, just come. Do you have any other kids? No. Just you, one. Just the one? Okay, so then he, you're the only one for him, right? Yeah. So he knows mom is here for me, I depend on mom. Have you tried going into his room and sleeping there and seeing if he stays? Oh, I did. He said, oh, can you change my room? Then I did change everything. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my next thing. Still didn't work. I put night lights, but maybe he's afraid. Mm -hmm. I put night lights. He doesn't want to sell. Okay. My son did the same thing around that age. <laughs> so they... Does he go up? Yeah. yeah he my thing is, up. I co sleep now. Uh huh. But because he's crazy to have bumpers at the moment. Mm -hmm. But he sleeps on his own a little bit. But that's what I'm afraid of now. Because I don't want him to have a habit of wanting to sleep with me all the time. Yeah. yeah. But he sleeps, but he's like, when I go to work, my mom watches him. Okay. He'll lay in the bed without me there the whole time. Yeah. So I don't know if he has a habit of sleeping with me because he can sleep in the room by himself without me being there. So. 
Will I have that issue? Well, you know, kids are really smart. And like I said, it could be an attachment issue. Okay. And it, yeah, it could definitely be an attachment issue where they know, okay, it's just mom and me. Okay. So they want to hold on to that. And this is where the five love languages could really come into play. So if you, you think about what your son responds well to. Obviously, he's not responding well to bribery, so gifts is not <laughs> it, right? So you got to say, okay, well, is he motivated by feeling like a grown-up? You know, I know that my son likes to feel like he's a man. So when he doesn't want to do something like clean his room, I'm like, well, you know what? Grown-ups clean their room. And yeah, I get a lot of huffing and puffing and stuff. But saying things and reminding him of things like that that motivate him are helpful. So you can kind of start with the schedule and say, you know what? This is what big people do. So I don't, why, why don't we try sleeping in your room one night a week and then you can spend all the other days? or we'll do something special for you. And then, or say just a few hours. If you can sleep there for a few hours, I'm gonna wake you up at midnight, and then you can come into my room. And just stagger it that way. Because I, it feels like it might, do you live with anybody else in the home too, or is it just the two of you? Uh, just the two of us. Yeah. Did you try a picture of yourself putting it by his bedside, maybe? <laughs> Try that, one. <laughs> that might work. It's just a, just a picture of his mother yeah. to see to wake up to maybe may help him. I don't know. Or a, a clothes clothes item like a shirt that you usually wear. Cause like my sister used to use leave um uh, one of her shirts that she had on during mm -hmm. that day to leave in the crib, and my niece will sit there and hold the shirt so she'll sleep by herself. Yeah. So maybe your scent. I don't know. That might, it might work, it all depends, but it don't work with him, yeah. no. The shirt doesn't work, but he also likes his space sometimes too, so I'm not <laughs> glad about that. But. If he, if you feel that there's some anxiety going on, that would be a good um, conversation to have with the doctor. You know, does he feel anxious about anything going on, else going up in the home? And, or if you have, just, you know, go out for ice cream and say, let's talk about what you really don't want to sleep in your room, what's going on? You know, let's see, I want to help you so that, you know, you can be like a big boy and not have to sleep with mommy all the time. I say, you know what? Mommy needs to rest sometimes and I want my whole bed. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And just remember, um, one of the things that I found really helpful when I don't have enough time, I, I can't go to support groups. I can't, you know, go to all the classes anymore. I can't go out and find resources on myself but my goodness the amount of stuff online that you find I am part of a few support groups on Facebook they're closed groups they're private groups and it's just of people who are in the same place as me so I belong to a group of just moms with children with disabilities because that really helps me vent my frustrations in a place that's safe you know it's okay to sometimes be really upset and really frustrated and downright be angry at your kids sometimes because they can be little jerks at times um, and it's okay to say that, I mean, probably not publicly, right? But you feel like you need to get that out. You, you're not a bad mother for thinking that, it's, it's natural. Um, but it's, that's really helped me in my own venting, in my own sanity as well. So, any other challenges or any, yeah? I, well, single mom, keep my son is five years old now. Okay. And in my eyes, he's a happy boy, full of energy, you name it, and he's, he's, he's just great. However, I had this feel, these two incidents with my next door neighbor, who's a very nice lady. However, she has witnessed one of my son's tantrums, you know, for anything, you know, mm -hmm. five years old, he cries for anything. Anyway, she was at the moment when he was crying and all that, and all she, had to say to me was, was, oh, he is doing that because he doesn't have a father. <gasps> oh, wow. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> well, that happened one time. I, I tried to ignore her. He was crying, whatever he was doing. Okay. Um, the other day, she's my next door neighbor. The other day, she walked in. She, she's a very sweet, nice woman. Mm -hmm. I like her a lot. <laughs> She walk and she has a son with Down syndrome, and my son and her son play a lot, blah blah blah. One day she walk in my place. She was welcome to walk in, and my son was watching TV, cartoons, and all she had to say to me was, 
Oh, he looks so, so sad. Maybe because he doesn't have a father. Oh my God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. The second time. Does her child have a father though? Hmm? Does her, her father have a child? He has a father. He is not part of the family. But mm. he, I mean, well, her, her child. Is well, he does not live with us. Is he around? He does. He does not live with us to the point that my son, out of the blue, said to, to his babysitter the other day, oh, mm, uh, in my house it's just my mom and I. So in his mind he's kind of adapting the idea that it's just both of us, a family of two, mom and son. But okay, going back to my, to my neighbor, I mean those comments are hurtful. They are, yeah, they have been, they are still keeping me awake at yeah. night. The question is, has a child can get depressed because his father is not around? So I'm gonna um, actually gonna comment on that with a general comment and then we can have a conversation. So I'm wearing this shirt, which has the name of four women, okay? Maya, Angelou, Chaka Khan, Ann Durham, and what's the last one? Aretha, Aretha Franklin. These were all single moms who all had amazing children. Anne, the one at the top, was Barack Obama's mom. Oh. Bill Clinton's mom was a single mom. There's all these kids out there who can be successful and are going to do great things because what really matters is how they're feeling fulfilled in their own love language and how you're raising them. And yes, having a father figure is important. And yes, developmentally, you need that. But you know what? The father figure doesn't have to be the father. And what you can say to your neighbor, I've had plenty of comments because I'm young, because my kids were so close together, because my son has a disability, that that was probably my fault. You can say, you know what? I'm doing the best I can with what I have and I am happy. Please keep your comments to yourself. And people get so mad when you stand up for yourself, but you're doing two things. You're, you are standing up for yourself and you're showing your children that they can stand up for themselves too. And it's not okay. It's a power play that people who don't feel good about themselves are trying. And you can go to your neighbor and you, you will be respectful because you like her and you want to continue a relationship, but just say, you know, your comments are just inappropriate and I don't appreciate them. Thank you. And make sure she doesn't say that to your son. Yes. Yeah, so well, she has said that in front of my son. Oh, my son is all of mm -hmm. It's not that's good. good. Because if she, no, no, no. she yeah. goes to his yeah. house, if he goes to her house, what does she stay behind closed doors? I don't know. Town, no. I question that to myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that could be why he acts out now because she's he feeding goes some over, 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 over her because we are next to our neighbor. Yeah. And as I said, she has a Down syndrome kid who's 10 now. So they play together, my yeah. son and her son. But now, when he goes over yeah, the place, appropriate. Watch, she says, what does she say? What does she do? She's probably jealous, too. We don't, you don't never know. Stuff it, like that. Especially because yeah, the sun has down. And she mm -hmm. said to you, outside, what she said behind closed doors when she has your child. Yeah. Right. But the, I mean, what? I mean, both both comments really, really yeah. so she's impacted well, me. That. But yeah. the, the mm -hmm. one that she said when my son was watching cartoons. Yeah. I was so focused watching cartoons, 12 years and a half, maybe back then. <laughs> and all she had to say was, oh, he looks so sad. He might be missing, missing. Oh, no. It, oh, that might be because he doesn't have a father. Yeah. It's very hurtful. It's inappropriate. And I, I defend it. I cannot her. Yeah. And I'm not going to sit here and try to make up excuses for her because as a grown woman, you should know better, know better. right? But I think that it's very important because these are the kinds of things that we face every day that we're going to continue to be facing is really establishing your ground and how you can respond to things like that and one understand that you're doing a great job okay that you are you love your kids you're doing what you need to do for them and that people like that should not be able to dictate how you feel and it's not easy it's not like I, you know it's easier said than done so but once you get into the um the groove of responding to comments like that and just standing your ground, you're gonna, you're gonna feel empowered. You really are, because if... And well, as I said, she's my next drug neighbor. Yeah. She sees me every day, I see her every day. She knows it's just both of us. Yeah. And I know my son is trying to, not really desperately looking for a male figure, 
but I think he may not, he may need that. Unfortunately, I don't have family here. Mm -hmm. So my family support is nowhere. And I have a good friend of mine who's also a single mom with a also almost five years old kid. We go together, out, we do things outside and we plan small trips here and there. We, we support each other. However, she has the, fem the model male figure because she has family here. She has uncle, she has nephew, she has male figure around mm -hmm. her. Me so your son? Me on the other side is just my son and I. I have no family here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, about how we can, activities or things that we can do to connect with our children, and that might be helpful too. Um, but no, you, you, that would also be a good conversation. And I know that he's five and maybe go to the library and get books that will, that are kid friendly so that you can talk to him about that. Um, for all we know, you're saying that he's not really seeking a male figure, but if you think. He did not know, but when he was younger, he was. He was so asking those questions. So his life at all? Or? It's not. No. Yeah. So it's. He, a, he has, he started a new family just for it. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So he's. Um, one of those. One of those. Right. <laughs> 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 right, so. We're telling you that you have already have a child and start the new family. Yeah. And, and that's something that we can talk about too, is how do we navigate stepbrothers or stepsisters or the stepmom with our kids? Because that's another important conversation um, that, you know, keeps us up at night. But to your point is start asking those questions and they don't have to be complicated because when you're five, you want to give your child the answer that, just a short answer, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're lying, but they don't need to know that much. They just want an answer. And so having that communication means that when he's 10 and he's starting to feel some type of way, or when he's 15, he's gonna know that he can talk to you about anything. And even if, when you initiate it, he'll know that you're there and you're listening. Yes? I think for me, it's just trying to, so I have a six-year-old son and trying to anticipate you know, what to look forward to, mm -hmm. um, things to avoid, things to be prepared for. Are there apps that would help make this journey easier? Those kind of things. Apps would have been awesome. When I was raising Jeremy younger, um, smartphones weren't a thing, so apps didn't help me. But what did help me was reading a lot of books. So um, I'm gonna raffle off this book today because this has like so many different scenarios that I can just like look up and be like, how do I respond to that? This was written by a single mother of two boys and she goes through things like, there's an actual um, scenario there where there's someone who tried to give her a compliment because she was a single mom and she took such offense to that because she thought she was being made fun of. Um, so to your point, I don't know about any app specifically, but what I did try to do in order to learn more about the things that I should be keeping an eye on was talking to the teachers a lot and doing things together. So every activity that Jeremy was into was, I was the annoying parent who was up there and be like, here's my email, here's my phone number, anything you see or something that I'm not seeing, please call me, please text me, please email me, I need to know. Because I also have a million other things in my head and I might be missing something or I might be overlooking something. Um, what, what, uh, what we what I did now was look up at these organizations. So with um, Jeremy, who didn't have a father figure and who, who has a big sister, um, he he likes to be around older boys or likes to be around other boys his age. So Big Brothers Big Sisters is a really cool organization that creates that mentorship. So I'd suggest that you look into that if I you did already. you did. I did. I already know them. And guess what? They do accept kids. Six years and now. Yeah. Uh, so next year. My son is so, not, next year, maybe. It's not ready. So, so but he's, he's going to be five. He's going to be, oh, he's going to be five. Yeah. I wanted him, I thought they were doing it for younger kids. No, they need to, they keep him to be six and up. Mm, yeah, I thought it was school age, so I was thinking five. No, six and up. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. But you know what? My information is there. So you can email me and then we can work on something together. I would love to have that sort of program like for now. Yeah. I mean, right now. Yeah. Well, we, if we can, I'll definitely help you look for something so that we can so get we you connected. So we have your email contact? Yeah, right. My email's right there. Oh, let me take a photo. Sure. Um, I also have a blog just about my experiences as a single mom. 
Uh, I mean, I write about everything from other kids who are mean in the playground to other moms who have been mean to me. Um, and just different resources, doctor's visits, school, how to navigate, talking to teachers, doctors, um, and just other people in general who are going to make those insensitive comments, who are going to que make you question what you do know and what you're doing. Um, one thing that has really brought my son and I together has been volunteer projects. And again, I don't have a ton of time. I can't, you know, I, I work, I'm tired and I'm a full-time parent. So really I'm gonna go do something for free, but um, it's really a great way to connect. And it's really teaching my son social responsibility and the importance of giving back because we ourselves received so many things. Um, and this is a really great way to connect and also to meet other people. You know, the key here is to connect with others because we can't do it alone and not be scared to be open and share and uh, meet other folks who are going to be there for us. Um, so we've made a lot of friends, more people than I can keep up with. So then I feel bad because I don't ever respond calls or schedule play dates. But now I know that I have options and that there's people out there who are willing to help me out. Um, I connected with a single mom recently. She has three boys and um, she travels a lot for work. So she called me up in the morning and we don't know each other that well, but she called me up in the morning. She's like, you know, so-and-so missed the bus. What do I do? And I said, I'm like right here. I'm happy to go and drive him. And so things like that really make a huge difference, not being afraid to ask. Um, so I have found that going into these projects together or activities has made a connection for me because I really need that but also for my son because he's made friends. And he's also seen that there's a lot of other kids who don't have a dad at home too, and that's okay. Um, church groups, that's another great way. If you have a church community that you are happy with or that you belong to, they have been really helpful. Um, and of course, we've placed a little bit of boundaries because they do say some things that you might not agree with, but it has been a really great way of finding support for myself. Um, and I've been really, I've really become more involved as I've gotten older because I've appreciated that side a little bit differently now. But that's been another great way to do things. Um, I always try to make my, to let my son choose one activity. Um, we can't go away on vacation every year and we can't do a lot of things. So, you know, this year it was, okay, well, we're gonna, we can go to the beach. So which beach do you want to go to? And just having him be in charge of that has been really great. Do you have any other comments, any other additional questions or challenges or good things? I mean, being a single parent is hard and we are underappreciated, I feel like, even though everybody says it's the hardest job in the world and kudos to you. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we get to embrace it all and we get to enjoy it all and keep it to ourselves. So if you have anything that you want to share. Yeah. Yeah, my son, he's two years old. Mm -hmm. He's going to be two next month, but he has a lot of <laughs> what do you want to do? I feel like I'm going to be good. I have to wash him, do something else. If I say don't do this, no, he won't listen. Mm -hmm. He do when he wants. And sometimes when he want to be kind, he can take maybe the something to clean. When he eat, he can take the plate and remove the trash. Mm -hmm. But I think when one. when they're this small, establishing structure and routine is key, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to happen overnight. But you have to start placing those like those schedules, putting them in place. So um, they might not understand it. But the more you do it in repetition, it's going to help. He's going to still have that energy and you need to satisfy that with activities and letting him play and stuff. But he's at the point now where he's he is going to understand what you're saying, um, like discipline, for example. So I started the timeout game with the kids from very early on when they were one. If they did something they weren't supposed to do one minute timeout two two minutes. And so and they start to get that. So if they can understand that there's a consequence to their action then you can establish that routine. So, no? Yeah, even if, well, I, yeah. Even if I say don't do that, I will give you something or 
Well, he's not going to care right now, and he's not going to care tomorrow, but you have to keep doing it, and you have to keep establishing that. And since you as a parent, you're, you're his first teacher, so he's going to understand that he has to, there has to be an adult figure who is the authority who tells me what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But it's going to take a lot of insistence and consistency, a lot of consistency. Are, yeah. I'm going to listen to you the way that we want to. Of course, because he's only two. He will need a lot of those, um, yeah. you know, pre preaching him, don't do this because we do this, blah, blah, blah. But he will get it. Mine is already getting it, even though he's not even fine. It's a process. It really is. But you, you can do things now. I mean, if you get him to do something with you for five minutes, consider yourself lucky. But that's also part of development is understanding that there is that certain stage that they go to where they're just going to be wild. But that doesn't mean that you can't introduce those behaviors early on. Are you connected to any early childhood um, organizations? No? Where, where do you... The problem is that it's not possible for me. I have to do everything myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to drop into the daycare. I have to go to work. I have to come back, I have to, so it's yeah, not like Yeah, well, and, and I think we, we've been all in that boat where we've all had to do this. We've all had to experience the child who will just have more energy than you bargained for. But again, you have to, if you understand and you accept that that's part of development, you, that's the first step, is understanding that. This is a phase. And now how do you respond to that phase? because you're not getting him to slow down, you're not getting him to listen to you, so you have to change your way of accepting that. But again, I really do think, and I'm a huge advocate for structure, and structure doesn't mean like, okay, at 11.15, you're gonna sit down and stop doing it, but introducing that early on, and um, looking at early childhood resources in the county, um, you know, and, and starting with something small, like. I know that you work. You mentioned that you work, and I don't know if you have time off during the week. I'm off and go to school and stuff. Yeah. So, what about the people? So, is daycare the only place where he gets where, that takes care of him, or do you have family members that do so too? No family. Here. No family. So it's just daycare. And have you communicated with daycare on what his behavior is like there and what they do? But the ladies, she told me that he's too much, so he, he has a lot of energy. They have to march him all the time but, because he's running, doing this. Yeah. yeah. But see, you understand, though, that he's capable of doing certain things because he's doing them at daycare. So then, yeah. So he has to see that at home, too. And like I said, it's not going to be easy and it does take work. But if you put in the work, the time right now, so it's going to get better as he gets older. Yeah. Because you don't want to create the sense of like, at home, I can do whatever I want. I can just whatever. You know, you have to establish that relationship of I'm the mom and I'm the authority figure. And this is how we do things early on. And you repeat it and you have to talk to your child like they're a little, you know, like they're your equal. Because then that they'll know that you're acknowledging them and that there's that mutual respect. And I know it's really hard to even envision that as a two and a half year old. But in the long run, it really will help. And you have to start that cycle early. Yeah. If it helps at all, so I have six-year-old twins. Um, one's a boy, one's a girl. And the funny thing is that my daughter is the one that is like super active, and she's still, I mean, she's always been super active as a baby. But one thing that has helped, has been very helpful, as she said, is just having the structure. Um, and even with the structure, I'm also a student. Um, and but with the structure, it's just planning your life around them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes I will go to the park and allow the child to run around, right? Because I'm trying to get them worn out while I get some school work done, you know? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes people talk about um, Chuck E. Cheese Ugh, um, as a horrible place. Oh. It is a wonderful place for <laughs> me because they are able to run around in a confined space <laughs> and get you know, activity. Um, I like monkey yeah. joes a whole lot. That's more younger child. Yeah, but just being monkey joes, it's more geared towards younger Monkey joes, it's like a 
Yeah, it's a it's like inflatable. Inflatables. Yeah, indoor yeah. inflatable. Oh, um, there's one in Germany. Oh, yeah. So great. Yeah. So I, I can think of something like that, but I know I read at um, Chuck E. Cheese. I just you know cover, cover my ears and I read, <laughs> but the kids are engaged, and so but it's finding a structure, but also finding ways to get them to exert their energy because they're human. They're gonna get tired, you know. Sometimes when we're traveling, I make them walk through the airport instead of using strollers. It's not that we don't have a stroller, but I need you to be tired <laughs> by the time the is playing, you know? Um, and so just finding ways to like, because they, if they have energy, like you want to engage that energy mm -hmm. positively. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. It is. Um, I used to, with the two kids being so close in age, they were 18 months apart, so I had a four-year-old and then my son was two and a half years old and it was like, oh my God, like they just didn't understand that although we had this structure in place where it's like mommy's doing homework or mommy's doing this, it just didn't work. And there were nights where all I could do was just shut down the book and had to give in and I was up until midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. when I had to get up at 5 a.m. the next morning just trying to do that and understanding that we will have to make sacrifices. There, there are things that we just cannot control, but that this will pass. And you got this and you can do this. It's not gonna be forever, trust me. Now I can go out on my own. I don't always have to worry about doing what they wanna do. Um, and sometimes I miss it, but oh my God, I am so happy. I don't have car seats in the back of my car anymore. <laughs> All right, so, um, if you're interested in the book, I'm going to think of a number, and I guess whomever is closest to it will win it. Okay? Does that sound good? Um, okay, let me, let me think of Okay, I got a number. Do you want to start here? One to what? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, one to 50, let's say. 50? Oh, God. Yeah, one to 50. Oh, wow. Oh, God. Is that too many? Okay, okay, let's narrow it down. One to 25. Because there's more than 10 people here. Okay, 23. Okay. 15. 7. 12. 16. 15. 5. 1. Okay, so my birthday is the 23rd. <laughs> 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 so I made that too easy. So um, I've, I've read passages from this book. I ordered it and I thought it would be a really good way to kind of end the session. But again, you can go to the library and check out books in the parenting session section. Um, the Five Love Languages is a really great resource. Um, online blogs, support groups are great. And if you, if you need anything, just please feel free to email me. Okay? Thank you, everyone.